Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number 88 of the Beersmith Podcast. It's September 2014, and today Michael Fairbrother joins me to discuss mead. Today's podcast is sponsored by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, the newest magazine on beer brewing. They have a big announcement. They're going from four to six issues per year and offering subscriptions for a limited time at the same price. Even better, they're giving Beersmith listeners a 20% discount as well. So go to beerandbrewing.com and use the offer code BEERSMITH. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com and use the offer code BEERSMITH and you'll get 20% off the new magazine and also six issues a year instead of four. And also the How to Brew video series that I shot with John Palmer. The first video, How to Brew with Malt Extract, is available now on the Amazon DVD store, Vimeo, and Amazon Instant Video. John and I are finishing up the second video, How to Brew All Grain, for release in October. You can learn more about both videos by going to beersmith.com slash DVD. Check out the trailers and release information on these new videos. And now let's move on to this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is Michael Fairbrother, owner and founder of Moonlight Meadery. Michael is a nationally award-winning mead maker who started his own meadery in his garage in 2010 and now one's, runs one of the largest ones in the Northeast. Michael, it is fantastic to have you back on the show. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Brad. So uh, it's great to talk to you again. How are things going at uh, Moonlight Meadery? Well, it's been a pretty traumatic year for us, but we've, uh, we're have we starting around the corner. So at one point, we had partnered with a... Uh, company to really kind of effectively promote our brand and uh, we've severed ways with them and uh, we're now getting direct relationships with our wholesalers across the country and I can tell you we're seeing tenfold increase in sales at this point. How's uh, how's distribution going? I know you're tra- you've been trying to get uh, get broader and broader distribution more and more states. Where, where What state are you covering now? Yeah, um, pretty close to 30 I think at the moment. Um, we just got into Michigan and Texas and we just got back into Florida, and you should be able to find our meads on draft in most of these states now. So we're starting to see a real big increase in the draft market for our meads. How about Virginia? Are you in Virginia yet? We're in discussions with the wholesaler. I've signed paperwork. I have not heard back, so that should be something soon. Fantastic. Well, I'm glad things are going well for you. Uh, we wanted to provide our listeners with sort of an overview on making five gallons of mead today was sort of the focus of the podcast. And um, first, I want to talk for a little bit about what mead actually is. So mead is the oldest fermented beverage. It's made from honey. So if you think of rum as a um, alcohol that's made from sugar cane, and beer is a alcohol that's made from malt, and gra- a wine is an wa- alcohol made from grapes, well, mead is a wine that's made from honey. And uh, it goes back quite a long time, if I understand right. Yeah, it's, uh, there's a cave painting in um, Switz- not Switzerland, Spain, that shows this woman harvesting honey from a beehive. Now, when you take honey from a beehive, the bees are going to come take it back from you. Now, honey happens to be the only food source that never goes bad, and it's also the only food source humans can survive on with just water. And when you put water on top of honey, bees can't smell it. And then what happens is the natural yeast that's there can start the dissolution of the honey and cause it to start to ferment. So how, how long do you think people have been making mead? My rough guess is 20,000 years, but probably longer than that. 20,000 years. So it predates beer by a little while, huh? A few. <laughs> <laughs> a few thousand years, probably. Uh, that's fantastic. Well, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the different styles of mead. Most people uh, you know, don't get a lot of exposure to mead these days. It, so your traditional mead is just made with straight honey, so you can vary the type of honey. How you get different types of honey is you go take the beehives to a certain type of field, and once the bees have harvested that honey or blossom, they make honey, and you take the honey from the hive, and you get, let's say, orange blossom honey. So orange blossom is much different than tupelo or wildflower, which is more of a generic blend of different types of honey. And um, we've I've used over 60 different types of honey for traditional meads. Uh, commercially, we make um, bra- uh, melomels, which are meads made with fruit. So a sizer is an apple melomel. Um, a piment would be a grape melomel. And then you can have methylins, which are meads made with the addition of spices. If you really want to get crazy, you can combine the two until you have a spiced melomel. Uh, that's what our best-selling mead is, which is an apple, honey, cinnamon, and vanilla mead. Is that the uh, apple pie? Yes, sir. <laughs> It actually does taste like apple pie. Pretty amazing. Yeah, we've got a rate beer rating at 100, 
at the moment, and it's um, we've seen just people wherever I go and try people on it because I do a lot of sales calls. They just can't believe it tastes so good, and you know the alcohol content's pretty high. Um, we usually shoot in between fourteen and sixteen percent for most of our meads, and um, it's not a single serve size bottle. It's meant to be shared, so you might see smaller size pours when it's coming off on draft, but go easy on it. It will hurt. Right, because mead is made uh, uh, at, at a much higher strength than beer, right? It's closer to wine? You're right. So we're, under our license, we currently have a winery license. So most of the meads we make are all over um, 12% alcohol, whereas a beer can typically be as low as three up to, you know, well, there's some pretty high ones out in the market <laughs> these days. But um. Well, I was wondering if you could provide us uh, with a brief overview of making mead. How is it different than making some, some beer? Sure. So there's you start with um, um, honey. You want to find the best honey source you can use. Um, I recommend knowing your beekeeper and finding out when they harvest the honey because when you get the honey, the longer it sits around, the more the flavor does change. So we try to use the honey as soon as it comes in here to the meadery. And... If I was going to make a first time ever traditional mead, or my recommendation to anybody trying to make a first time mead, go get some yourself some orange blossom honey. That's probably going to be hard to find locally if you're not in Florida or California, but it's worth the price to pay to buy it. Uh, we buy a lot of our honey through a True Source certified supplier, and what that means is it's a um, independently verifiable back to the beehive where it comes from. So you start with honey. You're going to use about 15 pounds of honey. So that's about a little over a gallon and uh, not quite a gallon and a half, but a gallon and a quarter. Um, we warm that honey up to about 80 degrees just so that we can dilute it in with the water easier so that we can mix it up. And uh, once it's all mixed up, you're going to then uh, create, um, you're going to rehydrate your yeast. Uh, we, we, we use Lavalin 71B for every mead that we make. So you're primarily using dry yeast, right? Yes. So we rehydrate it based on Scott Labs' um, published formula of how much uh, nutrients you need, how to what temperature to um, temperate the, the the hot water yeast combination before you add it back into the um, to the mead. But assuming you're using colder water, once you've got the 80 degree honey, your mead should be at a nice cool temperature. We try to ferment about 62 degrees. Uh, we do use Go Firm and Firm Aid K. It's usually a 50-50 blend, and um, what we're doing is we're splitting those nutrients into four additions. So the first one happens, mm -hmm. they make the mead, second one in 24 hours, third one in, in 48 hours, and the last one at 72 hours. Now, there's a couple different theories, and there's some really good books out in the marketplace. It's just a brand new one. Uh, just came across my desk the last few weeks. Um, mead make, um, what is it called? Hang on, I got it right here. Yeah, the complete guide to mead by um, Stephen Piatz, and it's it's really an interest, nice. uh, great intro book on mead making. And while I'm flying west to um, Las Vegas this week, I'm planning to finish on reading it. But um, what I've read through so far, he's done a great job at trying to make it simple and basic for everybody. Well, that's a quick overview, uh, and, and I'll put that that book in the show notes too, so folks can find it. Um, but let's start uh, start with the main ingredient, honey, and talk a little bit about where you can really find suitable honey for making meat. I know you mentioned a minute ago, go to your local uh, honey maker, but most people don't know where to even start. Yeah, so it's uh, Aperies is the name you want to look up. And you can find beekeeper associations. They're uh, pretty much all over the country. And, um, and it was interesting. Last year when I was at the um, UC Davis um, Robert Mundavi Institute, I learned something new about honeybees that I never really kind of thought of, which are the honeybees that most people think of today aren't domestic from the United States. They were all imported from Europe and um, other countries. Really? So, I yeah, had no idea. Yeah. They, and the first one that ever got imported to the western part of the country is actually a, a marker in San Francisco where the first beehive um, actually was brought in. So it's pretty cool to think about how much we are now dependent on these honeybees for pollination and um, the honey that they make. But you can get different types of honey. I go to um, I used to purchase a lot of honey and find out the different types from Honey.com, which is the National Honey Board's 
uh, website, and they have lots of good fundamental information on that. I've also just recently wrote, written an article uh, for Brew Your Own Magazine that will be coming out shortly on how to make uh, traditional meads, and we're talking about single-source varietal honeys and what the differences are. You know, honey can be light, like water white, almost crystal clear, uh, to jet black, like uh, buckwheat honey is extremely dark. Cranberry honey can be quite dark. Um, and, it, you know, it's interesting as you get different monosource honey from across the country, you may see that um, they differ quite a bit. And the flavor changes, the color can change. So even if you're getting buckwheat honey from California, it may not be different than the buckwheat, or maybe quite different than the buckwheat honey you might get up out of uh, Minnesota, for example. Mm-hmm. Now we, you know, and think of the challenges a poor bee has to have. So if it's raining, a bee hive, a bee can't will not go out of its hive to go forest or forage for uh, pollen and bee nectar um, from the the. Um, or do from the flowers um, to to create honey. So I just pulled up the uh, honey dot com website here, and uh, you mentioned that, uh, some of the beekeepers are linked in here. Yeah, there's a, should be a honey locator website on oh, there. There it is, right up right up on the top here. I'll try and let's see if I can blow this up. I clicked on that. It's coming up slowly here. There we go. Find honey state by state. So, yeah, so you can search you can by different right there. types of floral uh, types. I tend to like the lighter honeys for the uh, meads that I, I find do the best. Mm-hmm. Um, I will be presenting at the uh, UC Davis um, College this fall um, doing a mead maker course with uh, several other quite known, well-known, renowned uh, mead makers like Michael Fall from Rabbit's Foot, Ken Schramm from the Schramm's Meadery. Yeah, uh, Ken, Ken uh, won a major award this year at the HA convention, right? Yeah, that was pretty cool to see him win that. That's fantastic. Uh, I think he's the first mead maker to win the uh, <laughs> sort of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Homebrewers Association. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I've known Ken from a long time. Uh, well, I wanted to go into uh, varieties of honey and how they affect the flavor of the beer. I know, you again, you mentioned it very briefly in the overview, but I was wondering if you could go into maybe a little more detail on, uh, you know, what kind of flavors you get from some of the different varieties that people might run into as they're, as they're looking for honey. Sure. So Tupelo honey has a nice spicy character to it. So it's got a, a really light, flavorful note that has a really distinct honey um, flavor, but it's got a nice spicy backbone to it. Orange blossom honey has a nice citrusy note. Um, but when you think of the flower and then you think of the honey source that comes from it, it's not going to be like dominant. You know, it's, it's very light and it's very um, palatable. Um, reminiscent, I guess, the best way. Um, I've used buckwheat. I can't tell you I'm a fan of using buckwheat honey. Uh, I haven't used it commercially. Um, I tried three batches as an amateur, and I pretty much put it on my checklist to never make a mead from buckwheat honey so again. buckwheat is not uh, not your first choice then? Not my first choice. Uh, heather honey is, out of Scotland is another extremely hard honey to work with. It has a very dominant, earthy Honey note. You know how you can taste honey and you think, okay, is honey in that food? Well, whatever that flavor is, multiply it by 10. And um, the the average recommendations that I've been able to find in talking to Gordon Strong was to let it age for 10 years. So we have a barrel that we're now... (laughs) 10 years sounds like a little bit of a wait. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so I've got a barrel set aside and um, I'm being as patient as I am known to be and I will see what happens in 10 years. Fantastic. Um, so, I mean, those are some of the varieties, but the ones you recommend most are which ones? Um, so, orange blossom, tupelo, uh, cranberry blossom, blueberry blossom, blackberry blossom, uh, star thistle, um, avocado honey's got a nice flavor to it. Um, uh, eucalyptus honey's got a little menthol note to it. I've so. never had avocado honey. That sounds interesting. Yeah, meadow foam is another one that's very, very interesting. It's got a flavor profile almost of marshmallows, so it's got like a toasted marshmallow note to it. Um, really comes across and presents well when you're judging at uh, competitions like the Mazer Cup. Okay, so uh, the next thing you do, you got your honey. Uh, you're going to just add it to some water, right? And you, you mentioned you warm yours up a little bit, but are, are there any special water considerations that come into play, like uh, like when you're making beer? Oh, yeah, big time. So, you know, it's funny. When I was asked to write the article, I was trying to think, 
how the heck do I make meat anymore? Because I just don't remember all the details because it's just kind of ingrained. It's kind of like breathing nowadays, so I just go ahead and do it. Um, you do need excellent water. You need water that you could drink. Um, if your tap water isn't um, suitable for making um, most pale ales, um, then forget it. Go get some water that you're going to need or reverse osmosis or somehow filter it or, or adjust it to what you like. Our water comes from um, a reservoir here in New Hampshire. Um, it's all filled by you know natural aquifers and rain, and it's got a really nice um, clean flavor profile. They, mm-hmm. they do add um, bleach and whatnot to sanitize the water, um, but we don't really, I can't detect that. So I don't know if it's because be- I've been here for 20 years now and lived in this area that I just become immune to it. But I've been making meads with the same water supply for the last 20 years, and it's got what I consider some really good qualities to it, which, you know, it's, it's really drinkable. Um, I can make great beer with it, and it makes great mead. So, like, when I was in Arizona, not to pick on Arizona too much, but I went to Dunkin' Donuts to get a cup of coffee, and I couldn't even drink the coffee because of the, the bitterness didn't taste right with the way the water profile was used to make the coffee. Yeah, I... I used to live in New Mexico. We lived up in the mountains and had a well, and, and it was the same issue. We, uh, yeah, the water you came out of the ground, you really couldn't use it to make uh, even orange juice or, or, or coffee. So, um, so I mean, do you, do you typically have to add anything to the water, or you just uh, need nice, clean, finished water? You don't use real hard water or soft water or anything in between? Yeah, we, it's, it's pretty much a d- dead middle of the road water supply that we have. So it's got some hardness. It's got some, you know, calcium. Or we don't touch it. <laughs> you know, it comes in. I leave it alone. Uh, we never try to adjust our pH up front. Um, we have occasionally tried to do that. Um, that's not really the style that I um, became accustomed to. So we're kind of dialing back some of our procedures on how to adjust the pH of your mead. But you want to have a nice. Um, environment for your yeast to thrive in mm-hmm. so that's why we like 62 degrees mostly because we're fermenting in up to a thousand gallon batches at a time now all right so when you're making uh traditional meads the the thing you're trying to highlight as a home brewer or a mead maker is the um essence of the honey so you want to be very careful during the fermentation process to not cook the mead which by cooking it is it gets too warm So yeast is exothermic, so it generates heat during the process of generating the CO2 and alcohol, and that can warm up the batch. Now, with a typical home brewer, a five-gallon batch isn't going to get much different than the temperature of the room. So if you have a nice cool space like a basement or an air-conditioned room, Mm -hmm. you can set aside this five-gallon batch during primary fermentation, which should take several weeks. Um, Mead can ferment notoriously slow, and... um, the way that I've solved that with how I make me now is based off of what I learned from Kurt Stock and Ken Tram and several others, which is, you know, the staggered nutrients that you add gives the yeast as they're growing enough nutrients to really kind of become healthy and strong. Right. Because, I mean, it used to take a year and a half or even more to make uh, an average mead, and now you can do it in months, right? Right. We're, t- we're turning around mead in as little as three months. Um, most of our sit, because we're, we're kind of ahead of schedule on production, uh, for over a year or two uh, in the production space. But we're really, you know, they get better, a lot better with age. Um, but you want to be careful, as you would with brewing beer and not oxidize, you know, the, the must. And, you know, you don't want to splash it too much. But for the first three days when you're adding those nutrients, it's okay to beat some oxygen into the mead and degas it. Now, by degassing it, you're going to use like a whisk, and mm-hmm. you want to be careful <laughs> because if the beverage is fermenting, and I'd recommend homebrewers start with a five-gallon or seven-gallon plastic bucket um, clean and sanitized before they add their honey and water so that they can stir the honey and water to dissolve all the honey, add the yeast to it, add, you know, and then gently add the nutrients. You want to rehydrate the nutrients before you add them uh, to the must. Otherwise, you create a nucleation point for all the gas to dissolve, come out of solution, and you, you can lose a quarter of your batch coming up and over the top of that fermenter. So, Mike, let's uh, let's walk through some of that real quick, Michael. Sure. So, if you so we start by mixing the uh, the water and the and the honey together, right? Yes. And then we're going to hydrate the yeast, which you mentioned uh, your favorite is uh, Lavlin seventy one B. Do not use champagne yeast. 
it's going to ruin your mead. You're going to complain it's going to be too dry. It's not going to have any flavor. Um, and what I try to do is never, um, never is too hard a word. I try to very seldomly back sweeten the mead with raw honey because mm -hmm. adding honey to your finished mead will make it taste like raw honey. And that's the kind of the same thing as adding raw ketchup to the meatloaf instead of cooking the ketchup on the meatloaf. It just does not taste the same, doesn't have the same texture. It changes everything. Right. So by having um, the yeast added and your nutrients added, so you're rehydrating your nutrients before you're adding them, and you split them into four different allotments. So you hydrate your yeast as instructions of the fine, and then you, you're going to add the, the next ones every 24 hours. So you basically take a little bit of must out. So you use like a wine thief into a sanitized uh, cup, Add your uh, little bit of nutrients, rehydrate those, and pour those back in slowly. And then you can um, whisk some air into the mead. So what you're doing there, so the first three days, you're really just focusing on yeast growth. So mm -hmm. the as long as there's nutrients and oxygen, the yeast is not consuming and creating alcohol. It's growing. It's subdividing. It's having a grand old time. So happy yeast means happy alcohol or happy mead, and I uh, feel like the guy with a little paintbrush, uh, happy trees. <laughs> but um, it really makes a huge difference. So we went from, when I was homebrewing, it took me over a year and a half to get some of the meads that I liked. When I used the staggered nutrients, they were winning uh, best of show medals in as little as three months. Wow, that's fantastic. And let's go through the nutrients one more time. You mentioned uh, you use primarily two, right? Yeah, we use GoFirm and FirmAid K. Uh, okay. Other common ones, you could use um, uh, Demonium, uh, I can't even say it, DAP. Is a I've heard of DAP, phosphate. yeah. It's, um, which is an artificial nitrogen, so it's made from, I think, ammonia. Um, so it's got a really, um, I find, offensive aroma when you've added it to uh, mead. So I try to avoid that one at all costs. Um, but the nitrogen levels, and you can have all this stuff calculated, um, another good resource is, you know, and Mike Fall would tell you he has every single batch of his mead sent in for analysis so he can know exactly how much nitrogen to add during the uh, initial stages. Wow. I don't quite live in wine country out here in New Hampshire, so that's not quite a uh, feasible option for us. Um, so we try to wing it, uh, but with traditional meads, you can pretty much guarantee there's not enough nitrogen. That's why the Lavalin 71B mm -hmm. uh, works so good um, because it's kind of has a it will tolerate lower levels of, of nitrogen. Um, and that's an essential component for the yeast to be able to um, grow and uh, be healthy. So, uh, so we had these nutrients and in, 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 in what quantity and also when? Um, every 24 hours for the first three days, and it's it's. I, uh, I'm going off a of guesswork here, gentlemen. So please go check my website or check a uh, reference on this. And ladies, um, I, I believe it's like a quarter teaspoon um, of each for the first three days. Okay, so there's those three additions, and then I think there's one more addition, right? Yeah, the last one. Now we're we switched here. It used to be um, at thirty percent completion, so you try to measure and guess where. The, not guess, but measure where the mead was heading and try to figure out where the last addition should be. And it made it a little simpler, and we haven't seen that adversely affect um, the product we made, which is on the fourth day we had that last addition. Okay, so on the fourth day you had your last addition? Right. And then you mentioned aeration. Do you aerate right up front? Uh, when, when do you aerate? When do you stop aerating? So at day four you stop. So, but it's not like beer where you obviously don't aerate at all once you pitch the yeast. Here, you're trying to uh, encourage uh, oxygen to get in to help aid the fermentation, right? Yeah, it's crucial. So you, uh, so you're aerating for the first uh, four days, you said, right? Correct. Okay, and you're adding your nutrients, and uh, after those first four days, uh, you've added your, you know, you finished aeration, you've added that last nutrient. Uh, what does fermentation look like after that? Um, it's going to rock it. <laughs> so you're going to, it's going to take gonna, off. Huh? Yeah. It's going to, you've, you've essentially spent four days growing this massive yeast colony and we should talk about pitching rates. Um, here at the meeting, yeah, that'd be great. You know, we pitch it about, um, one gram per gallon and, um, all right, 500 gram pitch. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so essentially a gram of dry yeast per gallon 
And I don't know how much yeast comes in the small dry packs. Uh, I think they're typically 11. 11 grams is one size, and I can't remember there's another size. It's a little bit smaller than that. So you could... So like one pack, it would probably be more than enough, right? So my advice would be to use one. Now, okay. Gordon Strong, who's a good friend of mine, would recommend two. <laughs> two. So, you know, I think you can't be wrong. And with the cost of a honey and what you're trying with, going extra doesn't hurt. And right, because I mean, we're talking about, what, 18 pounds of honey and maybe a five-gallon batch, something like that, right? Yeah, and your honey can run as much as $8 a pound. So you're looking at you know significant money to make that batch when you're talking two or three dollars to buy some yeast, spend the money. Right, right. So you're gonna you're gonna pitch a, a roughly a gram of yeast per gallon, right? Correct. And then uh, at this point, you just you just wait it out, right? I mean, you basically just let it ferment, try and maintain the temperature, right? Yeah. What you should see is that it'll form a um, you know yeast bubbles along the top and. It's, It'll eventually start to slow down fermentation on the airlock, and you could rack it into a secondary at that point in time if you if you choose to. Do you recommend a secondary or not? It doesn't hurt it. I certainly do that quite often here at the meadery, so I would certainly say it's it's not a, a bad process to do that. But we'll usually let it sit on the leaves for at least three months before we move it into mm-hmm. secondary. So we really want to make sure it's finished before we decide that it's okay to come out of this temperature controlled environment. And go is into is oxygen a big risk? Like, um, you know, with beer, a lot of us have moved away from doing secondaries and so on because you don't want that extra transfer where you might introduce more oxygen into the beer. Is that as big a consideration with mead with a higher alcohol content or not? Um, it's certainly, well, you know, I find I haven't been able to, well, I can't quite always say that. I, I I've had challenges trying to make meads go bad because I tried to do a sour mead talk for the um, NHC this past year, and I couldn't really get one to go sour. Um, it is possible. I've seen, I've tasted a commercial example just the other day of a sour mead, and it's nowhere near as sour and tart as like a sour beer would be, mm-hmm. but it's got essences of that sourness in the background that kind of, it's, 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 it's kind of almost like how orange blossom honey tastes like oranges. You got a hint of it, you know. It's, it's, right, it's but you're, the oxygen doesn't just it's just spoil the you know spoil the mead like it does beer, right? Yeah, you don't certainly want to splash it around. You want to try to be as gentle with it as possible after you've um, you've done the um, your first primary, mm-hmm. and then once it hits secondary, you could possibly even do a tertiary on it and let it you know just become brilliantly clear. I mean, if you're going to enter meads into competitions, your judges are going to be looking for that. Mm-hmm. Now, you may make the best tasting orange blossom. Uh, traditional meat on the planet, but if you enter it into a competition that has the slightest haze to it, the judges are going to be pretty critical about, you know, okay, good color, good good flavor, but, you know, if it gets to a best of show table, it's usually going to get knocked off for the clarity because people in the mead world expect meads to be crystal clear. Now, I've seen mead in the commercial space and quite a few amateurs that are not crystal clear, um, but as as somebody that sold over a quarter million bottles in the last four years, my customers really appreciate and look for crystal clear meads on a consistent basis. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, are there any tips for enhancing clarity? Do you add finings like you do with beer, or is that not a not an option? Uh, there are quite a few meaderies that use like bentonite and other finding materials. Um, we tend to filter it, so we'll run it through um, plate and frame filtering uh, system just to really kind of polish and make sure. You know, I used to joke with customers that we don't get any propolis, you know, bee parts in the in the bottles, but you know, we don't have propolis in our honey. Um, the honey does come filtered before we buy it, but you can get raw right. honey where there would be propolis in it. And you know, you want to grow somebody out, you find a, a bee piece of a bee in there, and I don't know if you think of the worm and the tequila makes any sense, but you know, it's it's probably a uh, I'm sure the unique, customers would love that <laughs> unique marketing trend for uh, for somebody out there. Well, uh, how do you know when it's done fermenting? What's, how do you know when it's really finished? You should measure your gravity and over a period of time and just double check. So I had a mead that I made at my house um, probably four years ago now. And at about two years in, I decided to move it and to uh, put it into bottles. And then it proceeded to carbonate after I did all that. So even after two years, um, and granted, I didn't give it a lot of care and attention because it happened to be made about the same time I started the company. Um, 
it can still be have quite a bit of residual sugar, and that residual sugar can certainly um, spark into refermentation. Uh, we do use um, sulfites, and um, yeah, that was one of my questions I had. How do you how do you stop it from fermenting? So you, you got essentially a couple choices. You can flash pasteurize, which we certainly don't try to do. Um, you can. Um, try to let the mead become strong enough where the alcohol is really the limiting factor. And then you can sterile filter. Um, the other option is to add sulfites and sorbates to really kind of stunt the possibility for new growth and stop any fermentation that's in process. And the, the sulfites and sorbates are used, I, I think, in winemaking, aren't they, to help help uh, stop fermentation, right? Yeah, that's a, and it's pH-based, so there's no formula i can well there is a formula but i don't have it on top of my desk um but the, the, basically you need to look up the the formula for how much sulfites and sorbates you need to add uh to get to the right um levels to be able to be effective and it's all ph dependent so I you, see. batch to batch can change so you have so, to measure the ph and then calculate the amount to add and then add just that right amount right correct and we use um the sulfites come in a um almost looks like a giant alka seltzer tab so you can get them as small as two grams to five mm-hmm. grams, but you know that would be too big for um, any of your um, home brewer size. They're, are, they're sold in a lot of winemaking stores, though. I think, right? Yeah, I think you can. Get, well, I'm pretty sure. I'm, I'm, I guarantee it. A winemaker store would have it. Uh, any of the big online brewing uh, stores would have those as well. So, uh, how do you make some of the different variants of mead? Like, like how do you make sweet mead versus dry mead? <laughs> so. My general rule of thumb is 25% honey, 75% water will get you a nice semi-sweet to sweet mead. Now, if you increase that ratio to, to say, 27%, you can get a very sweet mead. Now, there are people out there that will go even much higher, and they'll start doing it by volume. So if you want to make like a Polish-style mead where you're taking 7 pounds of water and 7 pounds of honey and having a 50-50 wow. mix at that ratio – you're going to have some pretty good, strong honey flavor and viscosity to that mead. Um, a friend of mine down in um, North Carolina. I was going to say, is the finished finished product drinkable, or do you just kind of does it pour like honey too? Yeah, actually, well, my trip uh, kind of like uh, syrup. <laughs> yeah, but I, it's 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 phenomenal to be honest. When it's aged right, Mike Tripp got a South Carolina um, gave shared a bottle with me and my wife on our uh, second anniversary this past couple weekends ago. Right, and congratulations! Thank you. And it was a seven-year-old um, Polish mead, and it was breathtaking. I mean, it was absolutely phenomenal. So I'm going to try to see what I can do to make one here at the meadery. Um, I think it, I, I really kind of shied away from the concept, but you know, based on talking with Mike, I think it's uh, something I want to try to to try to do and lay down for several years. Uh, what about making mead with fruit or spices? When are those added, and how are they managed uh, in the fermentation, and so on? Sure. So I like to add fruit up front. So all fruit goes in into the mixer, into the primary, into the calculation of how strong that mead's going to be. So before you even start fermenting or anything, right? Yes. Um, we have made occasionally a couple batches with fruit post addition. Um, so like in secondary, the big difference is you mm-hmm. get more fruit forward notes to it and less mead notes. So you can really kind of over dominate with the fruit if you add it in secondary. Um, that may be what somebody's looking for. So you, you know, it's a, it's an opportunity to figure out. Well, you know, maybe there's a good experiment for somebody out there in the home brewing world to try and say, okay, well, I made this one with the same amount of honey and fruit, and added the fruit in primary, and this one, same sort of com- proportions, and added fruit in secondary, and see what the tastings. Yeah, I know with beer, most most people add add fruits in the secondary just because they're very difficult to manage up front. Yeah, and, and if you're using whole fruit, you want to be able to punch a cap down, which is the cap is the fruit layer that floats, floats on the top. So you need to be able to let that CO2 escape from out from underneath that fruit, and you need to let the heat that's generated out as well. So, so how do you do that? How does, how would, what's a practical way for doing that? Well, if you got a carboy, good luck. <laughs> but if you got a bucket, like I was suggesting earlier, you can then take the lid off, use a sanitized spoon, and, and just basically... Um, mix it a little bit yeah punch the cap down it's basically you know for us when we have 2,000 pounds of blueberries in a fermenter you know it's it's practically um, like a mashing paddle um, try, so you uh, really uh, you got a guy that actually gets in there opens the top and uh, and pushes it down breaks it up right 
Yeah, and it and the easier way to do it if you're at a larger commercial scale is called pumping over. So you pull the meat out of the bottom and you just push it up over the top of the fruit. Um, that that definitely can uh, cause some. Um, I almost want to say boil overs, but uh, foaming. Um, yeah, most of us don't have pumps attached to our fermenters, <laughs> though. At least uh, the home brew. Although I'm sure there's a few people that do. <laughs> yeah, it's not the worst thing. Um, but um, yeah, so pushing down the fruit. Um, if I was going to make a methaglen, which is a mead made with spices, mm-hmm. I add the um, the spicing after primary. So once it hits secondary, that's when I'll add spices. And you want to be able to taste. So you don't want to just say, okay, I'm going to put it on, let's say, uh, two tablespoons of vanilla beans or two vanilla beans for six mm-hmm. minutes. Taste it. <laughs> you know, get a wine thief, pull out the sample, taste to see where it gets to and where you like it, and then pull the meat off of that spice. Because it, it can really go over the top really quickly. I mean, some of our best-selling meads that we make, it's only on the spice for a fairly short amount of time. Right. Kurt's apple pie does sit on the spices for, you know, upwards of a year or more. But, you know, we're adding maybe 50 vanilla beans in a 300-gallon batch. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a very small amount. Um, so that's kind of subtle, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of the worst beers I ever had was uh, uh, jalapeno beer. And they overdid the jalapenos. And it was, uh, it was <laughs> and I like jalapenos, but it was way over the top. Yeah, and you can make some really good spicy meads. I mean, the one of the tricks that I've discovered is you want to keep your meads fairly sweet to support the spices that you might be using. Um, it's not saying you can't make a dry mead, but usually the spices, like say cinnamon, really support the what the perception that humans are going to want with sweetness to go with that flavor. And ghost pepper meads are some of my favorites, the guys down in New York City that can just really blow your socks off with some of the meads they're making down there. And um, they're hot. <laughs> they're clearly hot. Um, but they, they taste fantastic. Well, Michael, um, final thing I wanted to ask uh, before we go into you know, a couple of closing questions. But I, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, how do you bottle? How do you, uh, how do you finish the meat out? Yeah, so like I was saying earlier, we do filter everything we make, so we just want it to be you know as qu- crystal clear as we can get it. Um, but it gets um, it's a gravity f- flow filter for or filler for us, and then we usually use corks. But you can use uh, beer bottles and bottle caps. Um, so you can bottle it like wine, or you can bottle it like beer. Either way, right? Yeah, it works either way. And one style of mead that I forgot to mention earlier is a braggot, which is a mead made with uh, malt and honey. So that's usually you need a brewery license on the commercial scale to do something like that. Right. Um, well, let's go into some tips. Do you have any final tips for making great meat? Make a lot of it. Um, make it so much that you forget how to do it is the, the, the first thing I'd tell you. Um, have you achieved that state of nirvana where you've forgotten how to make meat? Yeah, I have actually. And I'm, I'm still trying to remember more of it because now I'm going to do a class on mead making out in California. And if any of uh, potential mead makers are interested, please look it up. It's a uh, university of Davis, California. Uh, the Robert Mundavi Institute is doing a um, short course on mead making. There'll be, like I said, several professional mead makers there to present as well right. as several uh, very well renowned uh, amateur mead makers presenting as well. So that's at the uh, university of California, Davis. Uh, yeah. When is it roughly? Uh, November. I November, think. yeah. That, that, that school is very famous, of course. They have one of the top brewing schools in the country, and uh, we've had uh, Charlie De- Charlie uh, on a number of times. Yeah, I got to meet him last year. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I've got a, uh, a pretty cool event happening where um, myself and the gentleman that work over at Heretic Brewing Company will be working on a uh, collaboration. So really happy to be working with Jamil on that and his team. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, Jamil's a lot of fun to work with. Good guy. Yeah, awesome guy. Um, could you take a few minutes at the end here to talk about Moonlight Meadery and uh, some of the new things you have going on? Sure. So we just created our first cider. Um, so this is a, um, a draft release only. It's called a um, it's a New England hard cider uh, that's been barrel-aged. Uh, when I was looking at the 2008 BJCP-style guidelines, I noticed that there was nobody making uh, commercial hard New England hard ciders, and I said, "Well, I can fix that." Um, so we made one, and it's called "How Do You Like Them Apples," and uh, it's a thirteen and a half percent. It's got a really nice apple note to it. We aged it in um, 
we made uh, some mead in a barrel that we're used to make bourbon, and so you get a nice little mead bourbon combination going on at the finish. But use brown sugar and just a touch of honey on that one. I am working to open my uh, my first brewery, um, so we're we're really? uh, yeah. That's uh, this is a, a news flash. Nobody's known you're, you're opening a, a beer brewery. Yes, sir. We want to make braggots and wow. uh, pretty high end beers. Um, so that's going to be called Hidden Moon Brewing Company. And uh, we've got the space. We're just working through all the logistics and paperwork. You know, yeah, so yeah. Uh, give your give your location here. I got Londonbury, uh, New Hampshire. But yeah. Uh, yeah, we're at 23 Londonderry, New Hampshire. Um, and we own now three uh, units. We're in a strip mall. So when people come up, they go, what, really? This is where our meadery is? But, you know, we're, we're still growing. I mean, in the last four years, we went from my garage to being worldwide. I'm going to Australia next month. Uh, to present and talk to the national uh, Australian National Homebrewers Conference, we've been doing mead dinners all over the country, and now I'll be going. And, and you to- have tours, I see, on the website here for uh, yep. anybody that happens to be yep, we're passing through New Hampshire. Seven days a week uh, for tours and tastings. Um, you know, come in mention every every day at eleven. It looks like uh, it starts at eleven. Yes, and if you mention uh, you saw us on uh, uh, Beer Smith. Or, yeah, I got that right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, ha- we'll give you half off your tour and tasting. Half off. Yes, that's sir. a great deal. Yeah, we're, we're pretty proud. You know, and, and everybody <laughs> hopefully doesn't forget that, you know, Brad and I met pretty much by accident, just sitting at a table at the NHC in uh, San Diego, right. if I remember correctly. It was uh, a little over three years ago now, and you had just you had just started the meadery, um, I think a year before, right? Yeah, that's right. And I had just uh, quit my job uh, almost exactly the same time, about a year before, to do Beersmith full-time. It's fun to work for yourself. So it's been, uh, for both of us, it's been a little over four years now. We've been on our own, and it's uh, it's been a great ride, for me at least. I don't know. I hope hope for you as well. Uh, it's been fantastic. We've had over 10,000 customers come to our tasting room in the last year. I've met homebrewers from around the country. I can't usually get on a plane up here in New England anymore without people recognizing me and start talking to me about mead making. But, you know, it's, it's, um, I, I wish I could have done it sooner in my life. I think I've, it's great. Yeah. So you want to say a few words about uh, some of the new meads you have coming out or some of the things that, uh, that are doing well right now? Sure. We're, well, Kurt's Apple Pie, um, we just released nationwide on draft. So you should be able to find that anywhere. Um, we're seeing incredible reviews from it coming in from Arizona where uh, Phoenix, Arizona took in 40 kegs uh, for their first order. So we're, we're almost a little terrified that this may become a bigger um, part of our portfolio than we had wildly thought possibly. Um, we're also Yeah, because I remember it was it, even maybe a year ago, you were you, your top selling one, I think, was the Blackberry, right? Yeah, Desire, black currants, blueberries, black cherries. That's the one I started the company with. And uh, it's still a really... Um, a and the, app, the apple pie is overtaken that, though, huh? By far. It's almost like left it completely in the dust. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, Michael, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I just um, ask you know everybody to uh, go out and ask for mead. Um, it will not become a mainstream beverage without the people like you listening to this show that know something about it and go out and ask for it. Yeah, it's kind of sad that uh, one of our oldest beverages is probably one of the least known these days. I, I, you know, I have people over the house and I say, "Hey, you want to try some mead?" And they're like, "What's that?" <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> we we get that every day here at the shop, and um, you know, it's but you, I, you know, you look at how many bottles I've sold in the last four years, quarter million bottles, and you think to yourself, "Wow, what am I doing different?" And it's nothing. It's it's just great mead makers are in the marketplace making great mead all over the country. And, um, you know, the better the mead makers are, the better the product's going to be, and the more the people will get turned on to it and not think it's something they find at a Renaissance fair and it's something they can drink once and they're like, okay, I try it. That's why I, I just picked up some at the Renaissance fair because I it was the only place I could find it. <laughs> it's hard to find in some of the stores here. But, uh, Michael, thank you again for, for joining me on the show, and, and thanks for being here. And, and thanks for all you're doing for, for the mead-making industry. And, you know, I do encourage folks that haven't tried uh, to go ahead and try a batch of mead. It really uh, – you can use your existing equipment. It does, you don't need anything new uh, to make a batch of mead versus a batch of beer. And uh, so, you know, go out and buy some good honey and, and get started. Right, Michael? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thanks again for, for appearing on the show, Michael. Really appreciate you being here. 
My pleasure, Brad. Thank you for having me. So again, uh, today on the show, my guest was Michael Fairbrother. He's owner and founder of Moonlight Meadery. He started in uh, 2010 in his garage, and he now owns one of the largest meaderies in the Northeast. And he's also a nationally award-winning mead maker. Well, a big thank you to Michael Fairbrother for appearing on this week's show, and thank you to our sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, the new magazine on beer brewing, now publishing six times a year, up from four. Get a 20% discount on your full subscription to six issues for the old four-issue price by going to beerandbrewing.com and get the discount code BEERSMITH. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com and use the discount code BEERSMITH when you check out. And finally, be sure to check out the new videos I shot, How to Brew Extract and the upcoming How to Brew All Grain video with John Palmer. You can find those at beersmith.com slash DVD. Again, that's beersmith.com slash DVD. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.